Hello, everyone. Welcome back to one of our um, 2022 Spring Symposium sessions. Uh, my name is Marley, and I am an external lead for the Stigma at ENDS at CU organization. So here I am today facilitating this presentation, and I'm with Maddie. Maddie can introduce herself. Hi guys, my name is Madeline. I'm one of the internal team leads with Sigma and CU this year. And I'm really excited to be participating in this, uh, in this symposium talk. Today we have with us Dylan. Dylan works with Carlton as the manager of student conduct and harm reduction. But uh, I think he would do a great job of explaining that to you and introducing uh, what he does. So Dylan. Awesome, thanks so much for having me here today. Uh, I'm Dylan, um, I'm the manager of student conduct and harm reduction here at Carleton. I use uh, he, his pronouns. And um, I'm actually also a, a Carleton grad. I graduated uh, in uh, criminology uh, with a concentration in psych way back in the day. So it's really nice to be uh, back at Carleton and in a, in a familiar environment with a, with a different lens on things. So thanks so much for having me here today. Awesome. So we have some questions for you. Um, and so Maddie, do you want to do the first one or do you want me to do the first one? I'd be happy to do the first one. So our first question is to try and understand um, what students want to know. So what are some questions that students would ask you about substance use? Yeah, so one half of my role is actually to respond to student misconduct. So a question that I'm often asked usually comes out of the context where students believe that they might be in trouble. Uh, and so they'll ask, you know, am I in trouble? And, and sometimes the answer is yes, but there's a lot of more nuance to that. And so the question I always ask is, how is it that I came to know you happen to be under the influence of a substance? Being the guy who responds to student behavior on campus, I'm usually the last to know anything that happens. So how, how did we get here? How are we having this, this conversation? I mean, lots of our students use substances and not everyone has to meet with me. So I try and shift the focus to what the concerning behaviors were rather than just the use of the substance alone. So um, we'll of course discuss if the student sees a role uh, of the substance in their behavior, um, but we don't, you know, student affairs generally, we don't discipline folks just on the basis of having used a substance alone. It's what happened during that entire time that brought this, this to light and what role do you see substance use playing in that? Some folks see a connection and others don't and, and we explore that from there. Um, I think the other, one of the more other common questions I get is, is, is my use normal or is my use problematic? And students are asking me this. Uh, and and they, it's also it's sort of in relation to their peers, right? So is, the, is my use normal relating to everybody else uh, around me? And so it typically leads to a discussion about sort of two different factors. For many substances, there are low risk guidelines that have been proven to lower your risk of short and, and long range harms for using a given substance. So that's one measure we can talk about. And for the example of alcohol, uh, you know, the, the, the guidelines state no more than 10 drinks a week for women, 15 drinks a week for men, and generally trying to avoid consuming more than three or four drinks in a single day. So that's one measure that we can use, right? But um, the other way I approach this with students recognizes the fact that not everyone is aware of or chooses to follow those guidelines for a number of different reasons. And there are many substances, things like cocaine or opioids, that don't necessarily have safer use guidelines per se. And we know that folks use these substances, so we need to have a, a more robust approach than just, well, this is what's been determined as, as safer, right? So I also sort of recommend that folks examine their relationship to the substance and the impact it's having in different aspects of their life to help them answer their own question. It's not really my place to tell you whether your use is problematic or not. It's, it's a, a bit of a journey you have to arrive at at your own. And so, um, you know, what may cause challenges for one person may not for others. And so a good tool that we tend to bring things back to and focus on is the four C's. So that stands for craving, control, compulsion, and consequences. So if a person is experiencing challenges in any sort of one of those areas, it could be a sign that there's an issue, especially if the use persists despite them being aware of some of those challenges. And so I encourage anyone who might start to have those kinds of concerns or questions to talk to someone. And it doesn't have to be a doctor or a counselor if you're not ready for that step yet. 
but just telling someone you trust, you know, I've been thinking about the way I've used this substance recently, and I'm not sure how I feel about it. Just taking that step can relieve a lot of the pressure and stress and stigma around that. And it also uh, lets you get some feedback from your peers and someone you trust in those groups that often have a lot of influence and impact on how uh, folks use substances. And so, you know, chances are if you're recognizing there might be some challenges with your own use, someone around you might also have maybe been thinking the same thing or maybe they're feeling the same way about their own use and you can start that dialogue, right? A lot of folks think when it comes to substance use, oh, I, if I want to talk about it, I have to go to a treatment provider. But if you're being honest and having open conversations with your friends, that can do quite a bit of help as well. Um, and the other uh, piece is that often my conversations don't start with people who are asking me about substances right away, um, but we might be discussing other challenges they're facing in real life relating to their physical or social well-being. And then we end up connecting the dots back to concerns that might be linked to or influenced by substance use, which is why we really encourage the idea of thinking in terms of substance use health more broadly and how your relationship with substances connects to other aspects of your life, rather than sort of sectioning it off on its own little island. Sort of how we think about, you know, when we talk about mental health, we've now included sleep as a part of that, right? And so we also know that substance use can impact your sleep, your diet, other pieces. And so we encourage folks to connect those dots. And often when I see someone who's, you know, reaching out to support in one area or the other, they maybe don't tie that back to their substance use right away. So I think, you know, the other question I get to is uh, what sort of supports and resources are there out there? But I think we have a question more relating to that a little bit further down the line. So I'll address those there. That's fantastic. I think it's really important that you touched on um, having the individual share, because I think when an individual has questions, it can also be because they have personal concerns. And with those safe use guidelines for alcohol, for example, just because X amount of drinks is what they say, it doesn't mean for a particular individual, um, they consider that use healthy for themselves. If, for example, lifestyle factors such as school, uh, time management play, play such a big role on that too. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just, it's really interesting. It's really interesting to hear how, how people come and ask questions like that and wanna know, is my use normal? Well, it would it maybe be a better question of, well, how is it affecting your daily, your daily life? Do you still feel yourself? Do you still feel like you're doing your best? Because for some individuals, maybe one drink a week would, would set them off. And it's really on a, a personal, personal basis there. Yeah, it definitely speaks a little bit to this idea that substance use in general is normative among the sort of post-secondary population, whereas I think a lot of folks don't realize like our spectrum of substance use ranges all the way from abstinence, for whatever reason, all the way to regular habitual use and then into problematic use or substance use disorder, right? But that those are all still on the spectrum, and so it is really a more... Um, more individualized response than a general like here's the guidelines and as long as you follow those you're good because that's not always necessarily true for everybody. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a good segue into our next question um, and um, uh, uh, the question is you know are substance use disorders prevalent on campus or on with the student population you know we have like a big culture like as students in general university students there's a big culture of drinking and taking substances um, socially. So um, I think that would be a question that um, students would have as well. Yeah, and I think when we are trying to address that, especially with, with you know, the student population and youth in general, it's really important to be mindful of how we're sort of quali qualifying substance use disorder or things like dependence, because it can show up in a lot of different ways. So the physical or chemical dependence is where the body's adjusted to require the substance to feel normal or good. And that's typically part of a shift towards the substance use disorder end of the spectrum where you see things like withdrawal symptoms if the substance isn't maintained uh, and really changes chemically in the body and in the brain that cause the desire to use that, that substance to persist. Then there's the other aspect of psychological dependence where you know the relationship with the substance is such that the person believes that they need to use it or in certain ways or certain times or adhere to certain rituals. Uh, and that can be accompanied by physical dependence, but it's not always. So, you know, the example of 
you know, I get really stressed before I do X. So maybe I'll smoke cannabis or, you know, it helps me sleep when I'm anxious. So I, I smoke before I sleep. And that doesn't always have a, a physical part right away. It can start as a psychological piece and then grow into that dependence. Um, it's really hard to get exact sort of stats on rates of dependence uh, and substance use disorder for this age group specifically uh, mm -hmm. for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, not all folks seek treatment and many folks who meet the criteria uh, for these, you know, conditions, to, uh, dependence or substance use disorder would actually consider their use to be safe if asked. Um, so, you know, a lot of folks, uh, don't, you know, they don't define it for themselves as substance use disorder or as a dependent relationship with the substance. They think it's safe for them. So it's, it's really tough. Um, and, and then the other piece is that folks at this stage are so young and new to their journey with substances. And that's not true of everyone. We do have folks that we support that have been struggling with substance disorder from a very early age. But for someone who's just starting their journey with substance use, you don't really know that you're heading that way until it's too late and the dependence mm -hmm. is sort of built or the substance use disorder is, is well on its way. So it can be really hard to answer that exact question, but to, to shed some light on things, we can use alcohol uh, as an example. It is the most uh, popular substance used by students. And if we look at a survey that was from 2019 to 2020, 84% uh, of students surveyed uh, had it reported using alcohol within the last 12 months. So that's a pretty big chunk of that student age population. And we also know that during the pandemic, uh, alcohol use increased, right? So looking at around 21% of uh, students uh, noted that they had increased their alcohol use during the pandemic. And for a number of reasons, the lack of routine, boredom, stress, those kinds of things. So, you know, we know that it's already really prevalent. We know that it's increased during the pandemic. And then interestingly, 56% um, of those students that did report consuming alcohol within the past 12 months reported experiencing one or more physical or mental harms in relation to the use of alcohol. And that's just one substance, right? We know that folks in this age group uh, are more likely to engage in poly substance use uh, and experiment as well. So, you know, it, it, whether the focus is on dependence, we know that uses rates is high and that there are these uh, potential harms that are, are out there. And what we do know generally for substance use in the post-secondary population is Rates of substance use generally are fairly high when we compare to the control group of, of folks outside of that age group. Uh, and it's definitely a time of first use for many different substances as well. So that experimentation piece. This also lines up with the age of onset for many mental health conditions. So things like schizophrenia, depression, generalized anxiety disorder. And so you're trying all these new substances. You're also in that age of onset where even if you weren't using substances in a vacuum, uh, there's all these other mental health conditions that can sort of express at this period of time. It's also a time where we highly emphasize socialization and often in new situations or environments where substances can be used to form bonds or loosen inhibitions or anxieties around these new environments. And it's also a time where there's a lot of academic, financial, uh, and professional concerns that are sort of all present at once on top of all these other things that folks are navigating. So. All these things sort of combined to create an environment where the potential for developing substance use dependence or substance use disorder can be quite high. And so I don't want to paint this really negative picture either because there's a lot of protective factors that are in place when we look at the post-secondary population around this, right? And we know, we look, you know, that it, substance use disorder at this point is still uh, less common than not in, in the post-secondary um, age group. We know a lot of folks do experience harms relating to substances, but not the majority don't develop uh, substance use disorder as a result. And so some of the protective factors are that that rich social network that you have the opportunity to build while you're in this age group and all these different opportunities for connection. Um, and these activities can be a source of you know, self-esteem and fulfillment. They also distract you from using substances, right? If you want to be a part of a club or a society or you have to spend this much time doing school, that takes away some of that free time that you would otherwise have to be able to use substances. Um, there's also extra supports and resources available that aren't always 
present in the same way in the community. If you're, you know, most schools have a counseling department, most schools have other resources that students are available to access that members of the general community don't necessarily have the ability to connect with. Um, and there's lots of uh, time for folks that are early in their relationship with substances to build healthy habits and relationships that sort of bring a sense of balance. Um, and there are also, you know, a lot of opportunities now when we're looking at COVID restrictions easing up uh, to give us space to look back on our relationship with substances, how that's maybe changed during the pandemic, and to see if we still want those relationships to be the same, or if we want to try and change those relationships to fit new goals or, or desires that we have as more things become available and more opportunities sort of open up for people to engage in. Thank you. I really like how well-rounded that answer was. Um, we talked a lot about all the elements, especially I like the element of balance. I don't think we talk a lot about that, um, like in the academic setting, you know, it's all work, school, <laughs> um, academics, grades. So balance in healthy relationships and balance in, you know, work-life balance is like a great place to start um, reflecting on that. So thank you for bringing that to light. Yeah. I think it's really great that you started talking about social settings as well. Personally, I feel like Carleton is a very community oriented school. We have a small, beautiful campus. Class sizes are pretty small, uh, especially in first year, you've got the opportunity to meet friends, make friends, so many mentorship programs to meet older students. And in, in that regard, um, how can students be allies and support their fellow students on their journey to wellness or recovery? Uh, similarly, how can faculty? Yeah, so uh, I think for that one, there a lot of the uh, pieces are sort of the same when we're talking about faculty or, or students. So a lot of my answer is gonna be applicable uh, to, to both, but I think a good, a really good place to start is by having that allyship mindset and being really mindful of your language, right? People remember things you say or do, and it's based on those factors that they're gonna determine whether you're gonna be a good support or not, right? So really being mindful of how you show up in a, in a given space, and you may not notice that someone's paying attention, but people tend to latch on to things that you say or your attitudes. And so if someone's struggling secretly, they meet you at a party and then you know maybe you've engaged in using some stigmatizing language, well, that's gonna sort of block you off as a potential support because they've seen that interaction happen. They're saying, I'm already struggling with this. I have an idea of where this person's probably at. I don't feel like they're a good support for me. So as you enter into these new spaces or meet new people or, or even the people you regularly socialize with, being mindful of that and, and what that communicates without you trying to directly communicate it. Um, I would also, of course, recommend engaging with any training that you, you can get your hands on. And there's some that we're gonna, we're gonna go over um, uh, in another part of this interview, but you know, person first language and educating yourself on what that looks like and what that can mean to someone, uh, to people who are struggling as well. Um, we have a, a good partnership with the Community Addiction Peer Support Association, which is an organization uh, run by and for folks with lived or living experience of substance use. And they put out a, a really awesome primer on stigmatizing language. Uh, it's a quick read and it's a really great place for anyone to start to engage in the process of educating. And when I say, for folks who don't know, when I say uh, person first language, that really means putting the person before the substance. And so when you're talking about substance use, you're talking about someone who's struggling, it's really focusing on that there's a person at the center of this and it's not all about the substance. Um, so the, the point is, is really important when we talk about folks using less accepted substances like cocaine, opioids, or other sort of illegal substances, because there's a, a stigma around those as well that um, can really make it even harder for the people to use them, that people that use them that, to seek support, right? Or they have difficulty seeking help from others because they feel like they need to hide that. It's not like, it's not as easy to say, oh, I'm struggling with cocaine use as it is maybe alcohol, uh, you know, cigarettes, cannabis, the more accepted substances because uh, you feel like you're maybe more alone. Uh, and so, you know, we really need to be mindful of how we talk about those uh, substances as well and how we, you know, 
Uh, we might be at a party drinking with friends. Maybe someone comes up that you know has tried the specific substance. How you engage further in that conversation is going to color those interactions and make people think twice about reaching out to you for support. I would also say that if someone does come to you asking for help uh, or you're concerned and you want to start the conversation with someone based on some behaviors that you've observed, you need to really remember that it's not about the substance. That is the, that is the key point. If you begin the conversation from the point of the substance being a problem, that's what that person enjoys. That's what they engage with. And if, if there is a concern present, something like substance use disorder or dependence, they're really relying on that substance for a, an important part of their life. And so if you focus in on that as the problem, it's going to be really easy for them to try and push you away. So, you know, focus on what you're seeing in terms of why you're concerned about them, right? You're not concerned that they're drinking. You're concerned that maybe they're not making it to work or they haven't spent time with their friends in, you know, however long. Those are the concerns, not the substance that's being used. Uh, make sure to be open and listen without trying to solve the problem. Um, so often we hear, okay, well, this is what's going wrong. So this is how you can fix it. When that's often not what somebody really needs. What's better is to help guide the person to determine what their goals are. Uh, and not what you think they need to be doing. It can be really difficult. We have that instinct, but it's not always in alignment, right? You might say, well, just stop drinking. And maybe that person says, well, I don't want to. Maybe I just want to have more control over how and when I use. And so that can be really empowering to put that person in the driver's seat and help them get to where they want to be. Um, as an ally, you can also always ask what their goals are and what's getting in the way of those goals, right? Most folks who are trying to make a change know what they'd like to do, but there's something blocking them there. And so just even asking the question about that is really important. And being patient and setting clear boundaries about how you're willing to offer support. Um, remember that you're not a clinician, or most folks aren't, uh, and it's not on you to fix the problem. You're really there to be a resource for folks, right? Um, and I think another piece is, is just committing to having open and honest conversations about substance use in your peer group. So something as small as saying, you know, I don't feel like drinking tonight, or I find cannabis makes it harder for me to focus on school, so I only use on the weekends, can make space for other folks who are having a harder time working through peer pressure from other folks that say, well, you know, we're going out drinking this weekend, and that's what we got to do, or, you know, I smoke another joint, like we're going to get really stoned tonight. And it's like, they, they know that you have made some decisions about your use and that can help inspire them to maybe reach out and start that conversation with you. Um, I'll also say as well, I can't recommend enough that uh, we do have a supporting a friend workshop here at Carleton. Uh, it teaches some really basic skills on how to recognize, refer and support folks who are struggling. And that applies for all mental health uh, and well-being, but um, you can generalize that to folks who are struggling with substance use because you may not know that that's at the root of the problem until you have that dialogue with them, right? Uh, and if the person you are supporting is a member of the Carlton community and you're concerned about them, you can fill out a care report. And so those go straight to our team of managers of care and support. They're able to provide additional outreach and support to students in need, especially if there's uh, academic concerns tied in with that. They're really great at navigating a lot of those university processes. Uh, and if the concern involves substance use as well, they're very good about reaching out with me and we work together with that team um, to determine the best way forward to support the student. Um, and, you know, I'd say again, much of this is the same with faculty, but there's an added importance of how much influence they can have over students. And by really modeling the person first language, promoting wellness, uh, they can have a really important direct impact on their students. And I think um, the key to really promoting student mental health uh, effectively is getting some of these really important topics into the classroom and in meaningful ways, because that's where students spend a lot of their time. That's where they are engaging with the university most directly. Um, and so as faculty can make space in their courses for talking about wellness resources or um, providing some information around mental health or what even Carleton has available, it can really lead to improved outcomes for everybody. I think that's such a well-rounded answer. I want to touch on two things you spoke about that always resonate really well with me. Um, person first language. I think it's really important to distinct between the words have and are. 
um, an example of that is just I have or I am. You are not defined by a substance use disorder or a mental health disorder. Uh, the only thing that defines you is you. So just because you're living with something such as a substance use disorder or mental health disorder, um, it doesn't mean that is who you are, right? So especially when you're talking to your friends or about your friends, your friend may have, it doesn't mean they are. Uh, and it's important to keep that distinction in your mind as well. And also with being with being an ally. When I was in first year, I believe I did take the supporting a friend workshop. And three years later, I still, as somebody who talks a lot, I still think about um, one of the big keys was, listen, your friend doesn't need to hear, oh, but when I went through this, I did that. This helped me. They need to hear, thank you for sharing. Um, what can I do? Or I didn't know you were feeling this way. Why have you decided to tell me now? not that was your problem, this was mine. Um, it's really important to be able to distinguish between that when somebody is coming to you for support. Um, it's, it's kind of that time to sit back and listen and be compassionate rather than take the opportunity to say, but this is what I did, um, if that makes sense. Again, not to take away from your problems, but sometimes when somebody needs a friend, they need you to be there to listen. Um, rather than to, to take over, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. If I could make a, a recommendation to folks who want to explore that thought a little bit more, there's a really great video. If you just type into YouTube, uh, Brene Brown Empathy, there's a really great video that explains that process and the importance of, of accepting someone's story and listening to it. So that's one. And then the other piece for folks who or maybe really looking into how can I do this, you know, support piece a little more um, intentionally, um, really looking at motivational interviewing and some of the basics of that um, way of dialoguing with people. It's a, it's, a, it's a way of therapy and a style of therapy, but it just also leads to better conversations with people using open-ended questions, um, you know, paraphrasing and, and reaffirming things that that person themselves is saying is it works, uh, I, I um, compare it to like Jedi mind tricks from Star Wars, like you're not even really adding anything new to the conversation, you're allowing that person to just provide you information and then holding up a mirror to them so they can see their own path forward. They're just, they need someone else to help them see it. Um, so, you know, that would be my other piece is there's really great resources out there for free. You don't need to be a clinician to start incorporating that into your daily uh, way of relating to other people. I like that a lot. I'm just looking at other questions. Um, maybe this is a good uh, time to talk about Carlton Resources. I know we mentioned a little bit um, with the, the care report. So maybe we can talk a little bit more about that and what specifically Carlton has to offer and how to access it. Even sometimes when I talk to my peers, I'm like, oh, don't you know about uh, health and counseling? <laughs> Get counseling with your tuition. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, definitely. And it's also, you know, um, one of the things that we're always prioritizing is to really make sure that we have supports available for folks, however they feel best about accessing them. So we are at the point now where there's a general understanding that people learn in different ways. We also understand that people can seek or receive support in different ways as well that might jive for them. And so we're we really try and have supports for folks, no matter where they might be on the substance use spectrum. So sort of abstinent, wanting to maintain that, questioning, maybe you are wanting, in a, you're in a maintenance period uh, uh, while you're experiencing substance use disorder. We wanna have something that's sort of there for everyone. Uh, and at the same time, we also want you to be able to have the option of sort of more self-directed resources, as well as ones that are Yes, with Therapy Assisted Online, it's uh, a bunch of self-directed workshops uh, that you can engage in, even on your phone. Um, and there are a bunch of modules 
based on cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, and they cover general mental health topics, sleep, anxiety, um, socializing with new people, new environments, all sorts of things like that. They have some specific modules for substance use. And in particular, they have ones for evaluating substance use to help you sort of answer that question we talked about earlier is, is my use problematic? Well, they help guide you through how you can determine that. Um, making decisions about use. So how to set goals and make changes if that's something you're interested in. And they even have relapse prevention uh, tools for folks who are in active recovery uh, or are struggling to make some of those changes. Maybe they have and they wanna maintain those changes. So, you know, from the substance use site, and that's free, you can access it 24 seven. It's a great first step if you are maybe feeling uncomfortable to talk to someone, right? Um, so I think that one uh, is really important and, and probably somewhat underutilized by students who may not be fully aware um, that that's there. Uh, I think one of the ones that's really important for me to be able to get awareness out about and that we are able to offer is, um, again, through our partnership with CAPSA, Community Addictions Peer Support Association, we have all people, all pathways meetings um, weekly for students and for staff, they're separate meetings on campus. Uh, and it's one of the best resources we are able to offer. Um, the meetings are open-ended and non-judgmental and they're specifically for students. Um, they're facilitated by folks with lived or living experience of substance use and it's peer support, not a regimented counseling session. Um, the group's there for all substances and can help with challenges that people face with other uh, compulsive behaviors as well, like gaming, gambling, or sex. And it's there for people with at any point of their journey. So there's no abstinence requirement. It's not like Alcoholics Anonymous where you have to say, hi, my name's Dylan and I'm alcoholic before you can really benefit from engaging in the program. It's it's a sort of a drop-in space. You miss one week, you're not you know missing out on on. Uh, some really crucial stuff. It's just a place where you can always be there and, and be comfortable and not be alone. Um, and you can feel uh, welcome in that group if you're just starting to question your use or if you are you know, actively working through substance use disorder. And it's also open to people who are supporting others uh, or are impacted by another person's substance use. So we know that students aren't just students. They have family, they have friends, they have all sorts of other social networks that are connected to them outside the university. And we know that folks may have people in their lives struggling with substance use there as well. And so you don't actually have to be actively using substances to be welcomed into that group either. Um, it's really about creating a safe space to talk honestly and openly about substance use, get support and learn about resources, but no one's there to push them on you if you're not ready to, to accept those yet. Maybe you just wanna be there and, and listen. But there's also no requirement to participate. You can just be there, you know, currently they're on Zoom. Uh, because of COVID-19, uh, but you can just be there, camera off, mic off, and just be if, if that's something that you're interested in, right? So the student week, uh, meetings are weekly uh, on Zoom on Thursdays uh, from 12 to 1, uh, so lots of time there to, uh, and you can drop in, drop out anytime, you don't have to be there for the whole time, so that's one of the things I think is so critically important for students, super low barrier to entry, it's accessible to everybody, no matter where you are in your journey, um, and I'm so thankful to CAPSA for allowing us to offer that to students. Uh, another one, uh, obviously, we talked about it a bit. Health and Counseling Services is an excellent resource. Um, after your intake appointment, you can be connected with a counselor who best suits your needs. Um, and so if you're honest and open and mentioning that substance use is of a concern for you, they, were in, they will be intentional in trying to pair you with someone who can best work through those challenges with you. Um, and even if you don't want to necessarily seek counseling, sometimes depending on what substance you use, there's medical concerns or challenges that come along with that as well. That you know, we have physicians here on campus that maybe if you're from outside of Ottawa, you don't have access to a family doctor, you can go to your doctor to a doctor here at Health and Counseling Services and receive those sort of medical uh, treatments as well. Uh, often the wait times are much shorter than what you can be find in the community. Uh, and you're working with professionals whose client base is students. So they're a little more sensitive to some of those specific concerns because that's who they see sort of day in and day out. Um, this next one sort of stretches a bit beyond campus, but I really wanna shout out the excellent work that's done uh, at Rita Wood Addictions and Family Services. They have, we've got a really good connection with them and they have a, a free rapid access program for folks who are under 25 and wanna seek support. So the program is a super low barrier to entry. 
Um, and you don't really have to be in sort of full-blown crisis or substance use disorder to be able to access that service. So I would really, uh, really recommend that one. And, you know, lastly, I'm not a counselor by any means, but I'm always willing to connect with students about the challenges that they're facing and offer supports. Uh, I've been working with harm reduction and substance use in higher ed for about five years now, and I'm always learning and growing through that work. If you're struggling or you know someone who is, you know, just reach out and we can start the conversation. Uh, my email is Dylan Brady uh, at cunet.carlton.ca. So, uh, you know, you can find me on the student affairs staff list as well. Awesome. Thank you. I think that was a really uh great section of information there. There's some of those resources that I've known about for years and some of them that I haven't. And uh, as somebody who's continuing to learn, I love learning about new things that I can tell people about new resources. But when it comes to seeking treatment, especially for a substance use disorder, uh, as previously seen with mental health disorders, there is a huge stigma. And there's a, a lot of stigma associated with wellness in general. Part of wellness is substance use substance use health, which occurs on a spectrum from abstinence to regular use um, to, to problematic use or substance use disorders, there's stigma associated with all of them, whether it be abstinence or a substance use disorder, but particularly with a substance use disorder. So in that, um, how does stigma affect students in um, and their substance use, or how does it affect uh, their ability to seek treatment as well? Yeah, I think that's always one, um, you know, before we had started the recording, we are talking a little bit about you know, some of the unique pieces of the, the student perspective uh, on substance use and how it's maybe not always fully explored. It's interesting when you look at folks in the post-secondary space, because they often face sort of double stigma in a way. So. Students face the same stigma around stigma around mental health, uh, well-being, substance use that we see occur in the general population, right? Where feelings of shame and guilt can be barriers to receiving treatment or even asking for help. Um, the language used by others can be hurtful or discouraging and contribute to really lowering your sense of self-worth. And there's a taboo around certain specific substances or behaviors that also push people to using alone or in more harmful ways. And that's just blanket stigma that applies to everybody. But on top of that, young folks and folks in post-secondary institutions face this immense pressure to use often within their peer groups. Uh, and it happens, peers happen to be one of the largest influences in your life as you're forming these relationships and growing alongside those around you. So for many who might be uh, away from home uh, to go to school, these new relationships sort of take on this second family feel too. And so it's not just friendship at that point. It's like your floor mates, right? Or other people in this club or society you're a part of it. It's, it's really hard to describe the like, type of friendship you build when you're in that post-secondary space. And so all these new social situations are really hard to navigate. And culturally, there's a lot of bonding that happens around substance use. It's in our culture. And we see that with movies like The Hangover or Beer Fest. It's also in some ingrained routines, right? You get a new job, we're going to go use substances to celebrate. You did poorly on a test, we're going to use substances to like put that behind us and just forget about it. And so all of these things, it, there's this pressure and sort of cultural acceptance of, of using. Uh, and this can be a challenge for folks who try to want to reduce their use uh, or use in safer ways because it goes a bit against the grain. You know, a common example I hear of pretty regularly is folks who get made fun of for something as simple as like choosing to drink light beer or having water between their drinks and, and they get called out at a party for that. And it's like, you know, even utilizing some sound harm reduction practices can sometimes be met with social pressure and this, this other form of stigma to, to use in harmful ways. So they often, people often feel like they need to make an excuse to not use or an excuse to use less, right? I talked to a lot of folks who were like, I, yeah, I volunteer to be DD because I actually don't really like drinking that much, but no one lets me get away with it. So I just, you know, they're all happy to have a DD. So I do that. And I think about like how much better it would be if everyone could have those conversations openly and just say like, sure, I'll DD, but also uh, I'm trying to limit the amount I use because it's better for me if I do. Right. And so um, there's even this like hiding of the reasons behind it. If you could come up with a good excuse. 
Uh, it also comes along with this pressure to be seen as an adult and dealing with all of the newfound responsibilities that come at you. And it's connected in, in some ways to the idea of being a good student who does their homework and gets the grades, but is also able to have fun and socialize. And if you're out of balance on either side of that, you see stigma coming one way or another, right? Oh, you're a nerd. If you spend all your time studying, and you're not out doing partying with your friends. They're going to make fun of you for that. Meanwhile, if you're partying all the time and you don't do well, people are going to say, well, you deserved it. So you've got to really have this balancing act that plays out in front of you and in your peer group. That's not just for you to manage. So, you know, there's this culture that it's permissible or even somehow safe to use substances in harmful ways when you're younger and that at some point you'll figure it out or you'll grow up. Uh, but we know from the neuroscience that that's not always how that works. Once dependence has been established, those changes are harder to reverse. And so folks in post-secondary are right in the middle of this balancing act. Um, and I, I actually had a, an older student once reflect to me, you know, it's perfectly fine to party and get blackout every weekend until it isn't. And no one tells you when that flip, that switch flips. And then, then all of a sudden, these things you were doing, you know, in your teens and 20s, it's not as cool when you're 30. And, and no one helps you along that process if you don't sort of have those open conversations. And I thought that was a really interesting thing that they shared with me when we were talking about that, because it is it kind of met, really hits the nail on the head with that balancing act that you're expected to be all things at all times and not have any challenges associated with trying to do that. So, and it, it also comes from sources like family, friends, professors, and, and even treatment providers sometimes as well, right? So that stigma uh, is cultivated in ways that make people feel alone, like they can't talk to others and it stifles conversations and prevents people from reaching out to get the help that they need and the support of others around them. So it's, it's tough as a student. I just wanted to pipe in just for a second, like, cause I'm one of those students, like I'm very atypical, like, I, I'm already like, I'm a mature student. Like I have a degree, but I came back for a second one and I, um, like I don't drink. I've never even been to a club before. And I, I'm also a ballerina. So I am dancing five to six hours a day, most of it on point and in, in those like funny shoes. And I, like, I, I don't, I didn't like drinking to begin with, but like also now with that, I don't, like it's pretty popular in ballet culture too, but like I, I still I don't want to do that hungover. No, thank you. So I don't do it for that reason also. And so I'm balancing strenuous academics with strenuous exercise. So like that's just another thing on top of it that like other students don't get. So like it's yeah, there's all sorts of reasons why students might not drink or just people might not drink. But if I say like, oh, I, I don't drink like people, the reaction I get almost like without fail is people will react as if I'm recovering from an alcohol addiction and they immediately, I mean, it's kind of okay because most of the time they're like, oh, I'm so sorry. But like, mm -hmm. it's just like, why don't you just go, oh, okay. Yeah, like, it's interesting. It's very interesting. So it's like, it's, it's nice that like people are, you know, aware of that, but like, it's just like, I didn't say I was recovering from an addiction, but like, it's, I mean, so like, it's like, I don't know how to react to that. It's just, it's a strange one. Yeah. yeah and, that, and that doesn't, that doesn't go away when you're not a student. A lot of my uh, female friends uh, who are, you know, a little bit older outside the post-secondary age group, when they mention, oh, I'm not drinking tonight or whatever, the first question they get is, well, are you pregnant, right? And so there's always these- Oh yeah, that one of them. It's that. like you need to have a reason as to why you're not drinking um, in your back pocket. And it can't just be like, oh, well, you know, I don't. It's like, it's become the default, right? In a lot of ways. And that that's definitely um, more prevalent with alcohol, but as, the acceptance of things like cannabis and other things uh, become more common, you know, it's, it's really that we need to, it, it's important to push for those open conversations around like, it's okay. And I don't need to have a reason or justify. I'm just not. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's super fair. Um, and there is, there's this also notion that uh, because we're young, a lot of us, I, I heard hangover mentioned, um, 
And I apologize in advance. I don't know if that term is offensive or stigmatizing. I think it's just the only way I know how to put it right now. Um, I've heard hangover mentioned and a lot of people in their early twenties, 19, maybe haven't experienced a hangover. They think they're uh, invincible too, right? So um, veering away a bit from the, the hangover idea, I, I do really like hanging out with my friends. Sometimes I really enjoy a drink as part of my culture and as part of my family idea. I'm, I'm the type of person who prefers to drink with my family and I like to drink wine at dinner time. but April is one of those months where I won't touch alcohol and a lot of the times when I'm at school I won't touch alcohol but when you get to hang out with your friends who aren't in your programs on the weekends they are parties. I'm very fortunate though my friends never question me if I've decided not to have a drink and I think that's great but if my friends want to drink that's fine too. I think you just have to be compassionate um, and it shouldn't matter why somebody's drinking or why somebody's not drinking. If anything, it just matters more so that you're together and looking out for each other, whether you are or aren't. Um, and, and I think that's just, that's part of allyship, friendship, and compassion. Um, whether you are somebody who likes to drink or, or don't like to drink, I think, I think that's something we need to keep in mind too. It, it doesn't matter why or why not. Um, it just, maybe sometimes it matters more that you're together. Okay, so we're reaching about an hour for this um, interview slash presentation. So is there any kind of final points that we want to touch on before we close? I know we had a video. I can play that video as well or whatever we want to do. Yeah, no, actually, I completely, uh, we jumped around uh, some of the questions a little bit and I missed the, uh, the, the boat on that one. It was really about uh, the, the conversation of how can you help someone uh, how can students help someone who's maybe, um, you know, actively in recovery and also this discussion of like, what does recovery mean uh, and how can it mean different things for different people, right? Uh, so um, I, we sort of take the wider view here and support anybody trying to make change to their substance use, right? You don't have to have, to, to make those changes or to be actively working on improving, you don't have to uh it'd be experiencing substance use disorder and so um the video was uh, it's it's something put together by capsa but i think it talks really about how we could maybe consider being more compassionate to folks who are experiencing these challenges and are navigating um some of the bumps that come up along the way so with that if you're if you're able to play it that would be i think great perfect i'm just wondering let me know if you can hear it or not so i'll, I'll share my screen and then um, hopefully you can hear it. <laughs> can you see the screen, first of all? Yes. Okay. And then... I believe I'm on my way to wellness. Can you hear it? Yep. Okay, perfect. Then some days I find that somehow I'm heading in the wrong direction again. Even though I've been doing my best to reroute my brain to have different responses to stress in my life. Having a substance use disorder was never a conscious choice I made. They tell me it could be the result of trauma or genetics or something else. All I know is that I struggle to stop taking substances despite the negative consequences. Of course, I want to have a better life but I don't know how long it will take me to get there or exactly what it will look like. I'm just finding out some of the challenges I have. I know that some people make changes faster than others and that each person's wellness looks different. Some people seem to get to their wellness place and stay there. Others come and go as their life unfolds. Me? I keep hitting roadblocks on my way there. Sometimes I head in the completely wrong direction and need a full return. Many people have stopped helping me when I do. If only they remembered that addiction is a medical condition that affects my brain in decision making. And if only I remembered, I could hold a steadier path. That's one of the challenges I face. I want to reach my place of wellness as much as they want me to get there. I know that life there will be less unpredictable for me and for them, 
But telling me that I have to get there by a certain time or by a certain route doesn't help. Imposing a deadline for arrival doesn't mean I'll meet it. It just gives people a false sense of control and makes me wonder why they have criteria for showing compassion to a person with a medical condition. I don't tell anyone who is ill what time they should get well by. I just hope they do and try to help them however they need help now. I've seen people stopping to help drivers with a flat tire or an empty tank of gas. They stayed until help arrived to be sure the driver was safe and could get back on the road. There was no judgment or disappointment about driving over a nail or running out of gas. I wish people would do the same for me when I hit bumps that slow me down or lose steam along the way. I wish people understood that finding my pathway to wellness will take me a lot longer if I'm walking alone. Yeah, so kudos for, to uh, CAPSA. They put out a lot of really great uh, material, but I think that sort of sums up our approach and one that's really important when you're dealing with younger folks who, you know, you don't need to be in active recovery as it would be defined, you know, by like the DSM or other pieces like that to recognize there's a, there's a better way to support people in, in making changes that they want to make. Um, and that's the approach that we're always trying to work towards here. Carlton. No, I think that's fantastic. In the video, um, the the speaker mentioned, I don't tell people who are ill what time they should be well by. And I mm -hmm. think um, CAPSA is now taking this approach. We're talking about journey uh, to wellness um, rather than uh, journey to recovery, just to take a more holistic approach. Like every single human is on their journey to wellness every day, every week, every month. It looks different, it may look the same, it may change. And why can you tell one person that their journey to wellness is wrong? It's not. Everybody's going through different things in life which have different influences on their day and their next day. Um, so I think it's, it's really important to think of it as an idea of wellness and wellness looks different and takes time and isn't a like one-stop shop, if that makes sense. Um, there's no one right way to do it or one right way to go about it. And I think I think if people could just be more compassionate mm -hmm. and understand that, um, then then it would really it would improve the way we look at uh, brain health as a whole and just health health in itself too. Definitely. Well, with that, um, I don't want to take up any more time in your day. No, we're very busy. Um, thanks so much for this conversation today. It was really valuable. And I love the perspective that you brought today and um, your like holistic and well-rounded answers. They were really great. So thank you. Thank you for the, uh, for the opportunity. I really appreciate that. And uh, I'll send you over my email and our safer substance use webpage if you wanted to uh, throw that. I think this is going up on YouTube, so feel free to throw that right in the description of the video. If folks awesome. want to reach it up for more. Perfect. Thank you. I really appreciate that. With that, I will end the recording.